First Thessalonians chapter number three. We're going to begin reading verse number one. The Bible says, Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone, and sent Timotheus, our brother, the minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith, that no man should be moved by these afflictions, for yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. Now, the Apostle Paul, right to the church of Thessalonica, He's talking to the church at the time after he had left the city of Thessalonica. He's already founded the church. He's been there for a while. He's labored. It's been planted. They've had people trained up. Then the Apostle Paul heads to Athens as part of his mission trip. Well, eventually he finds himself in Athens. And the Apostle Paul says in verse number one, Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear. In other words... What's he talking about doing? Well, he's talking about sending Timothy back to this church. And the Apostle Paul says, I knew that y'all needed to hear new preaching, new teaching, new instruction, right? To have some things reaffirmed that he says, I knew that I couldn't hold on to Timothy any longer. I had to send him down to y'all. See, to forbear something means you wait until you absolutely have to do it, and then you do it. Okay, that's good mentality, by the way. Okay, I know that, you know, why do tomorrow what can be done today? But forbearing is something not that necessarily you want to do. Forbearing is you're waiting until the last possible moment, and then you're going to do it because that's when it needs to be done. See, if the Apostle Paul had not forbore the timing, okay, the Timothy would have showed up too soon, those people wouldn't have been spiritually ready to receive everything that he needed to be taught, or needed to teach to him. If it had been too soon, the Apostle Paul may not have instructed Timothy in some of the things that he needed to go down there and give them answers for. When he says forbear, what he means is, I wanted to send Timothy earlier, but I had to wait. He said, then finally, the Holy Ghost said, send him, and then he, we sent him. Could no longer, couldn't forbear it anymore. Right? Timothy, go. And what did Timothy do? Timothy went. Okay, he says he sent Timotheus, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith. Timothy's mission was not to give them a new revelation, it wasn't to give them new doctrine. It was to establish them, meaning to reinforce, okay, just to reiterate what they had already learned but then it also says and to comfort you concerning your faith sometimes preaching has nothing to do with something that you've never heard before okay a lot of times preaching doesn't have to do with something that's brand new to your ears okay there's nothing new under the sun but a lot of times what preaching does is to establish something that you've already heard to where it becomes more concrete in your life or two it is to preach something that you've heard before, but you need it to comfort you now. Truly, a Christian only has two concerns, should only have two concerns from a spiritual point of view. Either they need to be established, in other words, reinforced, strengthened, okay, empowered, and a man can't do that for you. When Timothy showed up, what was he preaching? The Word. Who was he trusting that was really going to establish those people down at the church at Thessalonica? He knew that the Holy Ghost was going to be the one doing the strengthening. He was just there to be the mouthpiece for what they needed to hear. Okay, but then it also says, and to comfort them. The other thing that spiritually a Christian will need in this flesh, sometimes it's reassurance. That blessed assurance. Sometimes it's to be comforted. Did not Jesus say that when he would go away that the capital C comforter would come? Why did he send the comforter? Because he knew that you'd have to be comforted. Sometimes, as a Christian, it's not that you need to be You know that you're on the winning side. You know that nothing can separate you from the love of God. But every now and then you just need to have your spirits picked up. 
You need to be reminded that even though Jesus is your friend, you got other friends too. Sometimes you need to be reminded that somebody else had gone through that not too long ago and the Lord was faithful then, so he'll be faithful to you too. Sometimes you just need a friendly message from a friendly country. What's that called? Being comforted. And what does God do? God uses people, just like he used Timothy, to comfort us. Just as he used Timothy to comfort that church. But what was it that he was going down there to comfort them about? Well, see, that church was very upset. They weren't angry. Right? They weren't getting ready to mutiny. They weren't getting ready to vote the pastor out. They weren't having a church split based over what bath or garbage cans to put into the bathroom. Okay. Instead, what they were upset about was that the person that was used to start that church, the Apostle Paul, he's getting ready to go and face some uh, nasty things. He had told them when he was there that such a time would come. But now it's fixing to be about that time on the watch. So what's the Apostle Paul doing? He's trying to teach Timothy as much as he can. He's trying to give him, you know, both barrels loaded full of everything that he's going to need to go down there and help these people. And he's waiting just for the Holy Ghost to say, go. When the Holy Ghost said, go, Timothy went. And when he gets there, he finds that these people are very concerned now for the Apostle Paul. They said, if Timothy's here, he said that he'd send somebody right before things got real bad. Well, verse number three, it says, that no man should be moved by these afflictions. He didn't say their afflictions. He said these. Now keep in mind, this book was written long after Timothy went down there and preached to him. This epistle was written when he was in jail. So he says, way back when I was down in Athens, I knew that y'all needed to hear from Timothy. And when he showed up, he told you what I told you, which was, I was going to have to face some things. But God's still in control. God's still on the throne. This didn't catch God by surprise, and God let me know ahead of time so that it wouldn't catch me by surprise. And I told you so that it wouldn't catch you by surprise. He says, all of these things are according to God's will. He says, me, the Apostle Paul may not have even fully understood it, but we do know at some point that he knew that he's going to have to go stand before Caesar. And until that happened, he knew that nothing was going to kill him because God promised him that he'd stand before Caesar. He knew that he had to get to Rome. And when he wasn't in Rome yet, he knew that he still had a ways to go. Why do you think during the middle of that storm he had peace? One, because he had God. But two, he knew that this storm wasn't going to keep him from getting to Rome. If everybody else on the ship didn't make it, the Apostle Paul had full assurance that he's going to make it. Because he had to get to Rome. Well, the church of Thessalonica, they didn't know all the things that God had told the Apostle Paul. Wasn't their business to know. They're supposed to be concerned about going out and winning Thessalonica, not worrying about the Apostle Paul's ministry. But see, they loved the Apostle Paul. Why? Because that was a preacher that preached to the original group and they got saved. He's the one that God sent and the church got started. He's the one that, when they was lost in sin, God sent them by their way and he started preaching Jesus Christ to them and then their chains were broken and their eyes were opened. But they loved the preacher that told them about Jesus. Well, when they hear that, uh-oh, Timothy's coming. Timothy's here. Timothy, why did the Apostle Paul send you? The Apostle Paul sent me to comfort y'all, let y'all know that those things which he said were going to happen, they're fixing to happen. But everything's going to be okay. The Apostle Paul told them that everything was going to be okay. But the Holy Ghost sent Timothy a second time to tell them everything's going to be okay. Then the Apostle Paul writes a letter to him, reminding him. You remember when I told you that my afflictions, right, they shouldn't move any of your spirituality. Look at verse number 3. That no man should be moved by these afflictions. He's talking about the things that he's endured. He says, don't let what's happening in my life change your relationship with God. 
Don't let the devil use what's happening in my life as occasion to change what's happening between you and God. Don't let your flesh drive a wedge in between you and God because something bad happened to the person that told you about Jesus, the person that you care about, the person that they supported through missions, the person that they were invested in his ministry because they started off as a part of his ministry. But he says, don't let these afflictions move you. Look what he says, verse number three. For ye, for yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. Now he's talking about these, meaning his afflictions. But then he goes on to say that we are appointed thereunto. The Apostle Paul says, I'm the one going through the afflictions right now, but we collectively as Christians are appointed unto afflictions. And notice he says, for yourselves know, for yourselves know, that we are appointed unto. This isn't anything new to them. This has been preached unto them. Okay, anybody ever heard the verse that all those that live godly shall suffer persecution? Anybody ever heard where Jesus said that because the world hated him, that we being his disciples would be hated also? Anybody ever hear that the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour? Okay, those are all things that have enmity with you because God saved you from them and because you're no longer like them, they hate you. You didn't make yourself the enemy of the world. The world made itself the enemy of you. Not because of anything you did, but because Christ saved you. And they don't like anything different. You're a living testimony of the fact that they're damned and are going to a lake of fire one day. This world will be consumed with fire. Right? The world hates that you got saved because the world's still got sin in it. If you've been saved, sin, that was cleansed from your soul and it was sealed until the day of redemption. You're a walking, talking, living representation of why they need to change. The world hates you. Don't forget that. Now the people in the world, you may have friends, may have loved ones, may have people that you care about, they may not actively be you know, trying to destroy you, but they are watching you. And they're watching whenever afflictions come into your life. Now let's just stop. Wait a second. Afflictions, we need to figure out what that word means. Okay. An affliction is something that comes from the outside in your life. An affliction doesn't come from the inside. Okay. A burden is something on the inside, but burdens don't afflict you. you. You may be burdened by a burden, that's why they're called burdens, but it doesn't afflict you. A burden is something that you choose to take up. You willfully made that a part of you. An affliction is something that comes from the outside, has the intent of causing you harm, but an affliction doesn't destroy you. See, the devil walks about seeking whom he may devour. That's destruction. He wants to destroy all of God's children. God doesn't let it happen. Okay, afflictions are meant to, as he said in verse number 3, that no man should be moved. An affliction is something that is meant to get you from where you are to somewhere else. Just change a little bit. Because if you turn the steering wheel just a little bit and then put it back to straight, if you go long enough, you're going to end up way off course. But it's only a little turn. Yeah, but you went a long ways. And that little deviation ended up in a big change. And affliction is something that is supposed to move you, not instantly, but gradually. It's supposed to wear you down. The intent of an affliction... The end goal is that you just stop living for Jesus. 100%. All in, 
everything you got. It's meant to just move you a little bit. Because if you move a little bit, you're going to miss the court, you're going to miss the target by a lot. You're going to end up way off course. It's meant to wear you down. You may stay here today and tomorrow and the next day, but you may just take one step out of line that third or fourth day. And then you may stay straight and then just one more step. And one, it's meant to wear you down. It's an attack of attrition. It is to besiege you. The Apostle Paul prayed three times for a thorn in the flesh to be removed. Where's a thorn come from? Outside. I don't have any thorns in me right now. So if a thorn gets added to me, where'd it come from? Somewhere else. That, that thorn was a example of one of the things that he was afflicted with. Why did he have to have that thorn? Because God said three times, nope. Because God explained that with that thorn, the Apostle Paul could come to finally understand the full you know, idea and the full understanding so that he could write it down and preach it to us about how God's strength is made perfect in our weakness. And affliction is meant to move you off course. But do you know why God uses afflictions? To remind you that you are weak so that he can be strong in your life. The world means for an affliction to destroy you. God uses an affliction to exalt you. The world means for afflictions to get you off course, but God uses an affliction to assure that you're not relying on your strength to make it to heaven. You're relying on His strength to make it to heaven. And affliction may not be stronger than you. I've never met a thorn that I couldn't snap given enough time. The problem isn't that the thorn is so much stronger. The problem is that the thorn got somewhere that it shouldn't have been. Well, how did it get there? Well, look at verse number 3 again. He's talks, talking about afflictions. He says, For yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. God's got an appointment in your life, just like He had in the Apostle Paul's life, that affliction is coming your way. If an affliction happened to if you blood bought, if you're in His hand, His hand's in the Father's hand, no man can pluck you out of the Father's hand. If you're in the will of God, meaning that you haven't broke the hedge of protection that God has in your life. How'd that thorn get there? God allowed it to be put there. God may not have put it there, but God allowed it to happen. Even if you were the one that messed up and caused the thorn to be applied. Right? Anybody ever been out gardening and the next thing you know, you cut yourself? How in the world did I do that? You had no intention of doing it, it just happened. Right? Or if you'd like Brother Jordan... You went to go open something and your pocket knife was sharper than you remember and it just went right through it with very little effort and it caught you in the finger. Does it hurt? No. But I'm missing a chunk of skin today. Did I intend on doing it? Nope. But now I got a mark. Thankfully it didn't get infected. I didn't have to use Brother Ray's method of dipping it in diesel fuel. Okay. He says it'll work. I believe him. Not going to try it. Oh, point, that doesn't afflict me. I can bend my fingers today. It's not falling off. But how'd that happen? That was my fault. Didn't mean to, but it caused it to happen. But either way, you think that if you did something that God in His foreknowledge didn't know that you were going to do it? No, God knew exactly what was going to happen. And what the world meant for your destruction, God can use for your help and for your growth and for your maturing in the Spirit. Because God can use all things to work for the good of them that love Him. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? Afflictions are an appointment. God knows that you're going to be afflicted. God allowed it to happen so that you are afflicted. And then in the case of the thorn in the flesh, God will not remove that thorn until it's accomplished what the affliction was set there to do. How long did the Apostle Paul carry that thorn? As far as we know, he carried it until he died. How long did that, the woman with the issue of blood, how long did she carry that thorn? 
Well, the Bible tells us for 12 years. And it cost her everything that she had. How long did Darius carry the burden of a sick daughter? It wasn't 12 years. But she had been sick for a little bit. He was afflicted by it. In fact, he was only afflicted with the news of her death about halfway back to his house. He didn't know that she was dead that long, but that affliction was appointed by God so that his son could be glorified and exalted. You say, Brother Jordan, you telling me that God allows us to be afflicted? He allows it. Is it God that wants to destroy you? Absolutely not. Because if God appointed that affliction to happen, He knows that it's not going to destroy you. If it was too strong for you, He wouldn't allow it. Remember when I said that the devil desires to seek out those that he can devour? If the devil got his way, you'd been done a long time ago. But why hasn't it happened? Because God's got a protection around you. It's not because you scare the devil. It's because the devil is scared of the one that has robed you in his righteousness. Amen. Just as God put a limitation on the devil when it came to Job. The devil can't do anything that God doesn't say he can do. I don't care how big and bad and strong he may be. He can't do nothing unless God ordains it. So if a thorn finds its way into your life, it's because God said it could be there. But he said exactly how deep it could go. He said exactly how bad it could hurt. And he said exactly how long it's going to stay in there. It was appointed. Which means it didn't catch God by surprise. In fact, God made it exactly the way that you needed it. You say, I need thorns, Brother Jordan. No, but it was appointed that you would be afflicted. We need affliction. Now that's very unpopular teaching. Uh, but nobody raises their hand and says, sign me up for affliction today. Nobody raises their hand and says, yeah, bring me a bad time. But see, when you got saved, it was appointed that you would suffer affliction. Why? Because we're to be conformed into the image of His Son. And what did the Father's Son do for us? He was afflicted. It wasn't stronger than him. He still got up out of the grave on the third day. Hallelujah. After three days and three nights on the ground, he proved that the affliction that they threw at him wasn't stronger than him. He was afflicted from the moment that he was born into the world. But anybody remember the historical account of the murder of the innocents? Slaughter of the innocents? Herod found out that there was a new king born in Israel and he was afraid of his seat being taken. So they did some quick calculations and he said, well, that baby's probably under two years of old. Just kill all the males under two years throughout all the land where he had dominion. What happened? God sent a dream to Joseph. said, hey, get on down there and uh, you know, next. Go to the next county, basically. Avoid it. What did they live off of? How did they make a means of living in those years? Well, you remember that gold, silver, and myrrh? Or gold, frankincense, and myrrh? That the Magi brought to them? Magi didn't show up at the, at the manger. It showed up a little bit before that massacre happened. What do you think they used to buy and sell and get what they needed while they was in a foreign country? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. What was it? That was something that was meant to destroy his son, but God didn't let it happen. I'm sure that his mother and earthly stepfather right, were afflicted in a foreign land. They missed home. They missed friends. They missed everything that they had left behind they've got to deal with people that are strangers essentially they've got to start over again until what? until after all that business had been concluded God told them to go back 
But it wasn't too much for them. Didn't cause them to go crazy. They didn't die of a broken heart. Right? They weren't overtaken by homesickness. But that affliction was allowed. But God provided beforehand so that during the affliction, it wouldn't destroy them. What are you saying, Brother Joe? Everything appointed. But see, the reason that Christians don't want afflictions is because they're not fun. It's not a roller coaster ride. It's not something that you wake up the next day and say, hey, at the water cooler at work, you don't say, hey, listen to how I was afflicted yesterday. You're not going to believe this. It's not something that you openly talk about because affliction is something that you experience. Your affliction is different than everybody else's. Because in order for it to be appointed, that means that God had it designed for you. He intends it to do something very specific in your life. What is that, Brother Jordan? I wish I could tell you. But in the case of the Apostle Paul, it was meant to keep him humble. Because he found out when he was real weak, God's strength was very strong. Sometimes that affliction is to prove to others that what is in us is stronger than what's in the world. That's a demonstration of God's power and God's protection and God's provision in your life. Sometimes that affliction is meant to knock me down a peg or two. Now see, the Apostle Paul, I believe he had been humble pretty down. But the thorn was put there to remind him to be humble. Okay, but Jordan every now and then, not so good at staying humble. What happens? God's got to come and knock the pride out of me in order so that I can go back to being humble. But he's got to knock me off of that pedestal that I put myself on. Well, it wasn't a very high pedestal, Brother Jordan. It's still a pedestal. He's everything and we're nothing. We come from the dirt. We're lucky to walk on top of it instead of be crawling in it. But the thorn may be to show me that I'm not all that I'm cracked up to be. But in every circumstance, God has a purpose for it. But as we've already said, God has provision for it. The thorn may not be able to be taken out. Pastor Paul prayed three times, the thorn to be removed. Lord, let this affliction pass from me. And he'll say, no. Or he'll say, yes. Or he'll say, not yet. But in all three situations, God's got a provision. If he takes it out, God's the one that's going to be doing it. Because God's the one that allowed it to be put there. But he's the great physician. I'd rather him be removing thorns from my life. Okay? I mean, I like him, but I don't want Christian with sharp utensils anywhere near me in a medical capacity. Okay? I want him telling jokes to me after I wake up so that I feel better. Like the time when I had back surgery and then he showed up with a card that says, congratulations on your ginger transition su surgery. <laughs> and then he brought me a balloon that said, it's a girl. And then when the bandage on the back of me started leaking and I got up and there was blood on my t-shirt, he said, he had his first period. You say, were you angry at him? Yes, but I couldn't laugh at the time, but it still made me, you know, it would have hurt to laugh, but it still made me laugh. Now y'all know why, you know, he acts the way, they, all the stories of him acting up as a kid, he got beat for it, it just caused more brain damage. He's worse now than he was before the beating. They don't throw rocks up on roofs anymore. But I don't want Christian doing surgery on me. Even though I put the thorn there, I don't want to be messing with it. Anybody ever do this before? It's probably mostly just men because we're the dumb, stubborn ones. But anybody ever get like a thorn or a splinter? You get something in your skin and then you start there and you take like fingernail clippers or a little pair of Swiss Army scissors and you start digging at it, trying to get it out. And by the time you do get it out, the thing gets infected because now you got a crater in whatever it was where it used to. It's just a little splinter, a little sliver. What happened? I got it out, but you made it worse. 
But, well, it's not in there. Yeah, but also you're missing half your finger now. We got to get you to the ER, you know, hopefully get some skin grafts so that you don't walk around like a half finger freak. But, well, hey, I got rid of my ingrown toenail. Yeah, you ripped the toenail out. That's not, a, not the best solution. It was like, well, I started cutting at it, and then it started hurting, and then it started, so I just, I got tired of it, I just ripped the whole thing out. Well, that's one way to do it, but you're going to walk a little bit different afterwards. If God does it, it's as if it was never there in the first place. Everybody that he touched in the Bible, what's it say? That they were made whole. As if it had never happened in the first place. As if it never existed. Not even a scar. You ever think of this, Bob? The reason that Jesus still has the whole nail print and the holes that were in his feet and where they thrust him in the side is because if he touched it, it'd be as if it was never there. So he had to leave what man did as a testament because when he remade that body when he was in the grave, if he'd have touched it, it would have been as if nothing ever happened. So he had to leave what man did in those situations so that there'd be evidence of it. Because if he touches it, it's gone. But yet he endures it still to this day. Why? As proof of what he did for you. Not for him. He knows what he did for you. Not for the father. The father was witness to it. But he had to turn his back on him because of what he did for you. Who did he do it for? You. But what are you saying, Brother Jordan? I want the Lord to take it out. Well, in order for him to take it out, you've got to wait on the appointment to have it removed. Okay, anybody have... Thank praise the Lord, I've never had to do this. But anybody ever had one of them surgeries where they put pins and needles and things in you and they stay there for a while and then you've got to get the appointment to get them taken out or stitches? I had appointments to get stitches taken out one time. I found out I could do it myself. All you got to do is snip it and pull it out. Just like taking a string out of a suit, except if you cut both ends, there's nothing to snag it on. It just comes out. What are you saying? You got to have an appointment to have it removed. You had the appointment to get it done. Right? Surgery. Or you started off with you know, basic physical therapy. Or something. Well, that's not working. All right, we're going to schedule you to have this thing fixed. But in order to fix it, we're going to have to put some things in there. And there's coming a time that you're going to have an appointment to have them taken out. If God appointed it to be there, God already knows when it's going to be removed. When He scheduled you for it, He also scheduled you to have it removed. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? If God appointed the affliction, it was to serve a purpose. But right? if someone has carpal tunnel or if somebody has uh, hammer toes there is a procedure where they take pins and they drive them in that's to keep everything straight while everything heals correctly what is it it's just long needle pretty thick so it don't get bent and it's stuck in there it's meant to be there for a time not for forever it's meant to be in there while you heal while whatever was in you that wasn't good was taken out and something could be replaced what are you saying brother Jordan that thorn took the space of something that if you get a cut like I did on my finger there's a part that was there that's not there no more he said well it's not very big brother Jordan I know I'm using it as an example though but in order for a thorn to go in something it's replacing something your body will identify that that is not a part of you and it'll isolate it that's why they got to get it out because if your body surrounds it it's going to start attacking it and when it starts attacking it whatever that thing is it's going to start to die and if those cells of death and decay are allowed to run rampant they get into the bloodstream that's called sepsis that's not good so God knows that the thorn's going to be there but he knows how long it needs to be in there and just when to take it out 
But why was that instrument used there? Well, in the case of them needles and everything else, it's meant to stay there so that the thing that was there that was bad for you could be removed and that's the temporary replacement. It's not permanent. It's a temporary replacement. Well, the Apostle Paul learned that his strength was made, God's strength was made perfect in weakness. So what do you think that that thorn replaced? Maybe that thorn replaced all the strength that the Apostle Paul had in himself. What happened? God cut it out and put that thorn there to remind him. Why did he leave it there? So his strength wouldn't come back until God was ready to remove it and replace it with the Lord's strength. How long do them needles stay in those hammer toes or in carpal tunnel patients? As long as they need to, but not a day longer than they have to. What happens when they take them out? The body will heal itself as if they were never there. They may have a superficial scar, but all evidence that they were inside are gone. Been removed. You say, well, the thorn, I remember when the thorn was there. That's the point. The point isn't for the thorn to cripple you. Affliction was appointed by God to strengthen you. To prove you to those around you. And the world had the appointment set to destroy you, but God said, you can do everything you want to. They're just going to walk away with this with, with a splinter. And yeah, it's going to hurt. Because it wouldn't be called affliction if you weren't afflicted. It doesn't say you're going to stub your toe. Although if you stub your toe hard enough, it may turn into an affliction because you broke your toe. And if you're a man, you're too stubborn to admit that it's broken. You walk around on it for four weeks. Then the toe's black and it's dead and it's falling off. And you're like, well, maybe I should go to the ER now. What happened? That was something that was meant to be an affliction, but it turned into something a whole lot worse. Why? Because you wouldn't let God get in there and put the thorn in. You was afraid that the doctor was going to say, put this splint on it for a little bit. You got to wear this funky shoe for a while. I don't have time for all that stuff. Well, you got time to have part of your foot amputated because your toe's dying and now that's the only thing they can do to fix it. God says, I won't let you destroy yourself. I intend for you to be better. So I'm going to put this thorn there to replace something that was in your life. And when you're ready for the Lord to fill it, He'll take the thorn out. But the thorn is proof to those around you that you're not doing your will, you're doing the will of somebody else. He said, take his burden, his yoke upon you, for his burden is light, his yoke is easy. The burden is something that you chose. That's why he said, take my yoke. Take his burden. You have to choose to pick it up. The affliction is something that's mandatory. You don't get to choose it. It was appointed that we would be afflicted. Why? Because Christ was afflicted for our sake. So we become afflicted for His sake so that the message of the gospel, the purpose of what He left us here to do, He's able to use what happens in our life for His honor and His glory. You can't be used of God if you haven't been afflicted by God. Again, affliction doesn't kill you. Affliction is something by, by definition that is not stronger than you. Because if it was stronger than you, if it was meant to kill you, it wouldn't be called affliction, it would be called destruction. Affliction is something that is dealt with. You're able to handle affliction. It's not stronger than you are because God wouldn't have allowed it. Affliction is meant to be dealt with. You can't ignore affliction because affliction hurts. You don't know there's a problem in your body until your body tells your brain, hey, this hurts. Hey, we got a problem here because there's pain down here. Pain's not normal. Let's figure out why there's pain. Right, that's why people that are born without the ability to feel pain, that's why they're in such danger all the time. They may just put their hand on top of a stovetop, but they don't realize it was on and they don't feel that it burned them. 
their brain doesn't understand that there's a problem that they need to stop doing something if they stub their toe they don't know if it's broken or if it's okay they gotta go get an x-ray to figure it out because they don't feel pain the Lord lets you feel pain so that you know when there's a problem but what does affliction identify it identifies God saying there was something here and this thorn right now replaced it and the thorn will be taken out when what I want to replace what was removed is able to be put in your life you know when the thorn comes out after you've accepted the thorn's purpose if you're fighting the thorn the thorn's only going to dig deeper if you're fighting the affliction resisting the affliction the pain's going to get worse but when you admit and recognize that it's there and you accept it you can start caring for that thorn God said it's temporary he'll take it out a thorn may cause you to walk a little bit different but because you walk a little bit different pain's not as bad what are you saying brother Jordan if you start walking the way that God wants you to spiritually that thorn's not going to bother you as much you know when the thorn in the flesh hurt the apostle Paul when he was trying to do things his way but God's strength is made perfect in weakness when the apostle Paul got real weak God was able to do all the work and it didn't hurt the apostle Paul one bit that thorn was still there but it wasn't irritating why because the Paul wasn't moving God was the one doing the move anybody ever said well it only hurts when I put weight on it so what do you do you stand there with your weight on the other side all day long why so that there's no pain but what if the thorn is to get you to start leaning on him instead of leaning on yourself if you start walking a little bit different if you live a little bit different that thorn's not going to cause you any problems you know when it will afflict him when you go back doing things your way but if you do things his way eventually that thorn will be replaced with himself and it will be as if it was never there in the first place and the next time you get a thorn you realize it's because you weren't walking the way you should remember our illustration go out and do something in the garden all of a sudden ah I didn't mean to do that no but you did something the wrong way that's why it happened you knew the thorns were there but you just didn't expect that you'd come across one why did you come across one? because you weren't careful you weren't paying attention to what you are doing and it was because you didn't do something not because God did something to you but now that thorn's a part of you and you recognize now this thorn's not going to be a problem as long as I let God lead me and guide me and direct me because this thorn was meant to remove something from me so that he could replace it with him but if I fight it if I sit there and I dig at it I'm going to make the problem worse and what was meant to be a temporary thorn now becomes something that is an infection an infection is something that you can't get rid of your immune system might be able to get rid of it but you can't look at something that's infected and say be gone that, that takes something more than what you are able to do you can't will an infection away but you know what you can will yourself to do walk different when you get a thorn instead of picking things up with your dominant hand you say I've got a thorn there I'm going to start doing it this way why to avoid the thorn because to avoid the thorn means you've got to put faith in something other than what you're used to doing the thorn is meant to change you not for your worse but for your better and if you accept it because you know it was appointed then God's able to use that thorn to conform you to the image of his son use that affliction but the more you fight and the more you kick against the more damage it's going to do and it's damage that God didn't intend to happen but because you want to throw a fit it's going to get worse long before it gets better but if you know you got a broken foot and the doctor gives you a cast to walk around in and you don't walk around in it and that bone heals the wrong way you know what needs to be done the doctor's going to have to break that bone again so that he can set it the right way so that you can go back and do what he told you to do the first time 
that thorn keeps working its way deeper and deeper and deeper. God's going to keep reaching in and pulling it back to where it's supposed to be, but the more you kick, the more it's going to cut, the deeper it's going to get. And it's going to cause a whole lot more problems in the long run. All because you didn't want to admit that there was a thorn there. And that you have to change the way that you're doing things in order to avoid that thorn becoming a problem in your life. What's God want? He just wants you to do things His way. But when we're resilient to it, what's it do? He just puts a thorn there. It's not going to kill you. It's not going to overcome you. But because that thorn's there, you're going to have to think about how God wants you to do something a little bit different. So what do you do? You've either got to submit. Say, all right, Lord, we'll start doing it this way. And when you get it down, he'll take the thorn out. Because what was you, full of self, now he's replaced it with faith in him. The thorn don't need to be there no more. But if you're still clinging to yourself and what you can do, that thorn's going to stay in there to remind you just how much you're not able to do. How weak you really are. But all in all, the appointment means that God's got a plan for it. It's not happenstance. It's not random. God's got a purpose for it. And when the purpose is completed, there's another appointment to have the thing taken out. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.